What an amazing group of people that we get to listen to now. So thank you all for your individual talks. And maybe we'll try and pull it together and kind of talk about some of the common themes that all of you are, are kind of going through and dealing with in your various companies. And I think just the fact that you all have this kind of unprecedented ability and opportunity to unlock new sources of molecular diversity through your companies is, is an incredible opportunity and a huge responsibility, I suppose, that you have. So it's a real, real honor to get to sit with you on this stage. Um, I thought maybe we could open with a bit of a debate. Um, and I think there seems to be a debate in the industry, and maybe, maybe James, you could talk us through your thoughts on this just to kick it off, in terms of um, just fun fundamentally scientific discovery, what scientific discovery will, will look like and how it will evolve. And specifically, you know, how much in your view this is really about sort of human augmentation versus autonomous AI-driven processes and sort of what time frames you, you think that evolution will happen within? Yeah, sure. Um, so scientific, dis scientific discovery, as I grew up with, uh, standing at the bench throughout the course of my PhD, um, as you say, it's this very slow, hypothesis-driven process. Um, you think up an experiment, you try and execute it. Uh, the big change that's happened, certainly over the last few years, is just the availability of technologies to augment the human. And throughout the whole of society, there is this kind of thought, should humans be augmented through technology, or should they be replaced? Mm. I'm of the school of thought that for the purposes of scientific discovery, humans are terrible at hypothesis generation and execution, and should be completely replaced um, by autonomous systems. Where I think humans are incredibly good at are asking the questions of what should we be making um, and how should we be making them? So I, I see that humans and autonomous systems will work together, but any process that um, or an auto autonomous system can do in a superior way to a human, um, there's no point in having a human in that, in that sort of role. And do you think that's only a matter of time? So eventually kind of we will have end-to-end -end fully autonomous AI-driven processes where the human is sort of playing a role today? Or sort of what, are, what do our other panelists think in terms of how that might evolve over time? Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think we're moving towards augmentation first. Um, I think we will fully replace humans in the discovery process over the next two decades, let's say. What I don't think we'll be able to replace is the physician at the bedside caring for a patient when they deliver a new treatment or these sorts of things, or at least not in my lifetime, I hope. And it sort of takes us back to the day when physicians weren't you know, spending half their time writing notes, right? So in many ways, I see this you know, there's this fear around augmentation moving to complete replacement, but in many ways, I think it will free us up to do the things that we're really good at as humans, caring and compassion and those sorts of things. So mm -hmm. I still am ex excited about the future. Yeah, I remember when I was doing my PhD, I, you know, I finished about probably 11, 12 years ago, we were in a fully computational lab in the Department of Biochemistry. So whenever we would make presentations, uh, there were a lot of questions like, did you test this experimentally? Uh, and, you know, I would say a good level of skepticism around that. Uh, but I find now there's a lot more openness and thinking through, well, computers and algorithms are going to tell us things that we can't do experimentally. Uh, and they're going to give us a lot more ideas. And I think that the community generally is a lot more open to that because it makes sense and because it's proven to be like that. So instead of necessarily complementing hypothesis-driven research, is sort of a, a, a different area of focus where you're starting out with computer-driven uh, methods and thinking. Yeah. And it seems like from, from your presentations as well that there's a huge amount of impact that that can have across many different industries and verticals of application. And so I'd be curious, and I think there's a few different business models um, that your companies employ in terms of, um, you know, someone mentioned T-shaped before, but, you know, really how you think about the sort of depth versus breadth question of um, you know, what your companies are capable of doing and then how you need to kind of create a team to harness the potential in that area. And you know, Recursion, I guess, has gone through kind of a real evolution in terms of how you think about that specifically. So I'd love to hear from you first, Chris. Yeah, so originally we thought that if we generated a bunch of data that suggested a drug was potentially useful for patients, um, that people would be excited about that early on and would be able to sort of license that and, and continue focusing on our area, which is sort of very early in the pipeline. Um, what we found is that the conservatism in the industry at certain levels, not all, the scientists in many cases are open to this, but in many cases at a business level, there's a lot of conservatism and there's a sense that perhaps 
this is too good to be true or we don't really trust this yet. And so I think we sometimes find ourselves just sitting there waiting and there's a project that's not moving forward because we're waiting for a partner. Um, some of them are partnered, but in some cases they're just sitting there. So in those cases, I think we've decided we have to just build more vertically. And I think you're seeing this, at least in the biopharma industry, the consolidation of the tra uh, traditional players sort of into the late stages, the things like marketing, distribution, and these sorts of things. Um, and you'll see companies like ours moving into the sort of the early discovery stage and early translations uh, area and sort of taking over that space. So it was really a function of, of sort of speed and yeah. you know, your ability to see an opportunity and see it all the way through. And, and I guess, how, how do you think, or what implication does that have to your ability to go broad as well? And you know, Zymergen, I think, has taken a different approach in saying, you know, we'll be kind of an engine and more of maybe the data side of the company and, and kind of partner with others to take that through. So mm -hmm. I guess, how, how do you think about you know, whether you're leaving opportunity on the table and sort of how you're trying to capture more of the value? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think Zymergen has been very pragmatic in its approach. So although we've got, we knew we could do a lot of exciting things, uh, but one of the things we decided to do is to uh, work with clients that have existing projects that they want to do better in. And we use that as an opportunity to prove out our technology, prove that we could do this. Uh, so that's how we've been working uh, for a, a large part of what we do. We work with large companies to work on their materials uh, and then so and, and that's enabled us to um, prove the capabilities and then move towards creating our own molecules um, so I think that business model has worked well that kind of partnership there's other types of partnerships that we put in place uh, but it seems to have once you've proven the technology the platform once you've generated the data uh, it enables you to sort of go further and have confidence in the next layer of the things you want to do. Because, it, it, you know, some of the things are that there could be a lot of skeptics uh, out there with respect to some of this stuff. Yeah. And, and do you think at some point then you could kind of, you're relying on partners at this point to help sort of take things through to kind of real commercial mm -hmm. validation and value, but at some point you may be competing actually with those people that you're partnering with now. You know, how, how do you manage that? And maybe James, you're sort of earlier on in the evolution and so how you're thinking about it maybe in light of some of the, the, the conversations that we've had with, with both of your panelists now. Yeah, where I see there's an evolution of, of sort of business model and company is, is I, I see a lot of kind of companies similar stage to us at the seed stage and I see them migrating through um, when you're building out this type of company, you're actually trying to optimize your commercial, technical, and financing strategy simultaneously. So as a function of that, I see like early stage deep tech companies trying to prove out their underlying context in the context with like a real customer. And so they may start off with like a SaaS uh, sort of a service-like model uh, just to prove out the tech. And then they raise enough to kind of say, right, we're going to take this to the next stage and the next stage. But there's a constant tension around the breadth of these platforms in the sense that they could take on an insanely num an insane number of really meaningful problems and the cost that it takes to take any one of those products to market. Um, and that's a, that's a real tension, I think. I'm, I'm seeing an increasing number of interesting ways in which the financing of those products can, can happen. So. Um, for each company and each in different vertical, it will make sense to take these products to a different stage of development and then push it down that value chain, either through partnership with multinationals or through financing arrangements, um, in, sort of independently financed subsidiaries. And I'm curious as to how you define what category your company is in and how much you're a data company um, or how much you're kind of a next generation pharmaceutical company, for example. And, and maybe, maybe you could talk a little bit about kind of what implication that has on ultimately, um, you know, who the buyers are in this space as well. I mean, is Google going to come in and buy one of the companies? Is it more likely that Roche comes in and buys one of them? I'd, I'd love your views on that. I can start with that. Uh, we've, uh, we feel that we're very much a, a technology company. And so I think more recently we've, try, we've been talking about ourselves as a molecular technology company. Uh, so we focus on molecules, but it's really a technology company where we're producing a lot of data, deploying a, a lot of uh, different types of uh, algorithms to analyze the data. And about, I would say, a quarter of our staff are in the tech team. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of scientists as well in different teams, but a quarter uh, of, we're about 500 people now, uh, are in the technology team at Zymergen. 
How do you think about that maybe being a bit more sort of vertically integrated as such? Yeah, so I, I think we thought of ourselves as a technology company when we started and it's still our soul. But as we start thinking about our first clinical trial, which is, which is hopefully coming up in the next few months, um, I think in some ways that sort of has forced our thinking to change a little bit. And we're a little bit more of a, of a hybrid in many ways. And I, I guess to that point that Shiva was making on team, you know, what implications does that have for the type of capabilities and you know, how do you operationalize the breakthroughs that you guys are making internally? Right, uh, this is one of the hardest things. I think starting from scratch, we could build biologists and data scientists uh, sitting next to each other and talking to each other and having lunch together and all these sorts of things and they could learn each other's language and, and as you grow and you start to bring in, in our case, people who might be more in the sort of clinical trial space, um, it becomes increasingly hard to keep that culture. At the same time, it's one of the things that I'm focused most on in, in my day is maintaining that culture of technology and sort of leveraging machine learning to make decisions in a less biased way. And I think that if we can maintain that, we'll be pretty successful or we increase our, our chances of being successful. And it's why I'm less worried about competition from the really big pharmaceutical companies. Not that they don't have an incredibly important role to play, but they're just so fundamentally different from a cultural level that I just doubt they'll be able to kind of move back into the space that we all occupy. I more worry about us moving right. towards mm -hmm. their space. Right. Right. And I guess, you know, we've, we've mentioned a couple of times conservatism, and I think that there is this real blend of kind of the bullish nature of, you know, tech company build versus kind of the more conservative life science build. And um, given that maybe it would be helpful to have a few proof points there, and kind of I'm sure you're, you're pushed for that, what do you guys think the sort of first real win in this space is likely to be? And kind of what proof will we have that AI actually drives translational success? Yeah, so I... I think the first proof point is the fact we're all sitting here, the fact that autonomous systems can, can generate like incredible complexity. Um, but to actually see if you can harness that and deploy it in a commercial setting, um, I, depending on who you're speaking to and at what you're trying to achieve, they want to see different levels of proof points. So certainly um, when I'm building out our company and thinking about what do our deep tech investors need to see and, and of course they're having to go deep and understand the technology and so it's more of a kind of technical risk piece. When you're speaking with a, a very conservative pharma company, um, you just don't actually really get it. You have to speak the same language in them. You have to show them an asset that, that would fit perfectly into their system, an asset that they've tried to develop and failed to, mm. and that's a language that they speak. Yeah, I think that before you even get to the AI part of this, there is a lot of uh, culture, and I like how you mentioned that word, um, and a foundation that needs to be built to enable artificial intelligence to be effective at any company. So it's important to deploy technologies to capture the data. There's you know, sensors and there's infrastructure. We spent a lot of time on infrastructure alone just to capture the data we're producing, store it appropriately, be able to move it around and manage it, and then do all the things that you need to do to data to make it usable. So all of that pipeline is is time consuming, expensive, needs a lot of thinking before you even get to the machine learning part. And so building that kind of culture and infrastructure is critical mm. towards this goal. And it takes time. It's not something that you can snap your finger and make happen. It, it needs the, the founders to buy into this vision. It needs commitment uh, to make this happen. Uh, and, so, and then the machine learning is actually you know, a component of that whole journey. And I think to a large extent, it's, you know, machine learning is going to be used and is currently used in many different types of uh, companies. Uh, but this is something that really takes a lot of investment. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we got to talk a little bit about maybe what the change would be in the healthcare system from a, from a physician perspective. I thought that was a really interesting point. Um, what do you think the changes will be in an academic environment? What, what are the changes to academia, given your companies and sort of the, the rise of this whole space? I think that's a really exciting question. I, I like. I, I'm really excited by the amount of disruption that's going to take place globally as knowledge starts to be generated within companies rather than uh, within within academia. And I think that that's going to cause us to start asking ourselves some some really interesting questions around um, who should have this knowledge, how is it shared. Um, I don't feel that academic institutions in the main have the right funding mechanisms to both build and sustain these types of platforms. And as a function of that, 
they'll probably migrate into, the vast majority of them will migrate into probably training schools um, for people who will come and build these platforms within a kind of commercial, commercial environment. Maybe one thing I'd add, I think there's a lot of things that we're discovering right now where there's not necessarily a commercial avenue for development. Yeah. Um, so it's not that it's not useful or impactful or, or um, something that somebody wants, but it's not something that we can, as a company, probably spend our time doing. And we talked about the case of some ultra, ultra rare diseases. Um, that said, the worst thing for us is when we make one of these discoveries and there's not an easy way to actually develop it, um, it, it, it feels totally inexcusable to actually cast aside that information. And I think there will at least for some period of time be uh, a providence in academics where you can take up these sorts of uh, maybe less broadly applicable solutions and, and try and iterate on those and maybe make treatments for really, really rare patient groups or other sorts of things. And maybe just one, one final question. Um, so Kindred operates this model of equitable venture, and very much it's about peer sharing and peer support. So um, if you had one piece of advice for your co-panelists in terms of how to create success in this arena or, or to sort of aspiring founders in the audience looking to build in this space, what would that be? Maybe I'd say find other founders. Um, often it can feel lonely to be a founder working in a new space and getting no's and, and getting yeses and all these sorts of things and find other founders and spend time with them. Talk. Cling on to your co-panelists. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Shiva? Uh, I think uh, there's value in being pragmatic on one end but also innovative on the other. So kind of do those things in parallel to show value and I've seen that succeed. Uh, and, I, and I think that's a really important uh, approach to take generally. Last but not least. Yeah, I would say um, this maybe is, is a particularly kind of UK-centric bit of advice, but I would say be bold. Um, I think the thing that I suffered with for a long time is I capped the level of the company's ambitions based on the perceived level of resources around me. And when I realized if you uncapped it, then the resources would find you. Um, that was a pretty trans transformational moment for us. So I'd say for, for, for all UK founders, just be bold, dream big. And wear a tie, generally. And wear a tie, generally, you, yeah. You <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, to the panelists. Can you just wait here for a second? <laughs>